This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Michigan Studios of WKTV. Let's go inside for Silent Voices. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices. I'm your host Dennis Lawrence. Today we have the Bush family back with us. Uh, Scott, the father, and Nicole, the daughter. So Scott, I want to welcome you guys back to the show. And Scott, you know, I, Last time I was so fascinated by your story and I, I wanted to get a little bit more in depth, you know, uh, can you tell us how CPS got involved into your family's life and can you tell us a little bit about the day your children were taken from you? Yeah, um, yeah I will try to keep this as short as I can but get to the point. Um, really what uh, everything really started was we had asked um, DHS uh, to get involved with our life. We were having some problems with my teenage son. He was having some behavioral issues. He's got ADD, ADHD, and ODD. So he had had some issues with behavior and such. And um, we had uh, spoken with a couple services about um, maybe having some in-home counseling um, to try to make sure um, you know we could keep him stable as far as medicines, getting the correct um, uh, things in that, um, trying to make sure that, you know, we were doing things right, per se. Um, and we had had services in for about six months to a year, and, you know, we had several caseworkers, and it, it was going really well. Things were working pretty smooth. Um, his behaviorals were getting um, somewhat better. Um, we were about ready to close um, our services. And there was a lady uh, on the very last day um, through Lutheran services that decided to put some sort of, I, I really don't know what it was called, a F14 or some sort of thing uh, through CPS. Um, so which in return, CPS came out about two days later with a detective to um, interview all my children and me and my uh, wife, Tracy and um, went through this interview process and you know the lady walked into my home and I'd never met this lady before through CPS and um, I'm gonna have to say excuse my language but I have to put it exactly the way it was presented and put. The lady walked into my home and the very first thing that she said in front of me and my children were um, I am a, uh, I'm a bitch, I am the definition, I am the word, I am exactly why they created that word bitch. She said, don't fuck with me or I will make your life a living hell. That's how she started it off meeting her. Um, then the process started where she said, well, we're gonna get in contact with you. We're gonna speak with you again in a couple days. Um, a couple days later, she came back and said that they were gonna start some programs for us to keep our family together as they call it this 28-day program, intensive therapy, and so on and so forth. So they started this 28-day program, this intensive therapy, and, and so on and so forth, and told me that I had to get my house in working order, as they called it, even though during this process when she came over, I was uh, remodeling my home at the time. Um, she seen that. I had wood, I had tools, I had things all over. I was in the process of cutting and chopping all that when she came over. Long story short, we went through this 28 day program um, and with a lady through Catholic Social Services, she was absolutely thrilled with me and my family. She was happy with me and my family and said that we were a wonderful family to work with. Um, she had all great reports. Um, 
And at the very end of the 28-day program, she had sent us a letter in the mail and a card stating how much our family was just an awesome family. We were all wonderful people and so on and so forth. We got a report back from CPS, um, from that lady in particular that said, uh, you guys are doing wonderful. This is great, house looks good, this and that. You guys are doing just a wonderful job. Mm, the lady from Catholic Social Services told us um, to be very careful. Um, she said, when you start these programs, you cannot irritate, you cannot go against, you can't say anything to any caseworker because if you do, they will use that against you. They will look for anything to be able to go into court um, to pull your children. We said, not a problem. We have nothing against anybody. This lady came into my home through Bethany Services and she had um, spoken with us uh, about several issues and things. And one in particular um, was about getting my son's speech therapy. Mind you, I'd had caseworkers involved with my you know, family for about six months to a year. And she wanted us to get um, these services done with him. And I asked the question of why. And she said, well, we just feel it's a necessary deal. And I said, fine. So I had called my area district, school district, and <clears throat> asked to get um, a speech therapy done and spoke with a lady up at the uh, Intermediate Sioux District uh, in our area. And she had asked me a question, um, why do you want speech therapy done on your child? I said, well, I don't, CPS does. And she says, well, we don't do it that way. That's not how we work. We don't do things just because CPS wants something done. That's not the way it works. We take children here who the parents feel has a speech issue. I said, well, I don't feel that there's a speech issue um, my personal self, but you know, we need to schedule an appointment. She goes, well, we're not going to do that. And she hung up the phone with me. I had it on speaker and the lady at Bethany heard me and she got absolutely irate with me and said that I did wrong. And I had asked her, what did I do wrong? I said, I was asked an honest question about how I felt about, you know, why I was calling. She told me that was wrong. She was going to report it to the caseworker or the higher up one which she did, they came back and told me I had to reset this thing up. So I called them back and said, hey, I am going to set up a speech therapy for my son. Um, I don't know what a problem, but I wanna get it done. We might have one. And the lady said, you're dealing with CPS, aren't you? And I said, yes. She goes, yeah, I understand. She goes, we deal with them all the time. And she says, this is wrong. But she says, I'll tell you what, just so they get off your back and it's not a headache, we will set one up. She goes, they're always trying to pay big brother with you and families, and they want to go through this systematic getting everything done. So I set one up, and she sent me some paperwork to fill out, which I sent, and I filled everything out but the very front page, which is nothing but a check about certain issues. So I sent the paperwork back, and the caseworker said that we didn't fill it all out, even though we had an appointment, and the lady at the school district was fine with that. Um, she was irritated and mad again by that. And she asked us why we didn't fill it out. And I said, well, we didn't completely understand some parts of it, but the lady up there said it was fine. We could fill it out when we spoke with her because she is the one that's gonna be doing the assessment. We had the appointment, everything set up. She went and reported that to the higher up lady at CPS, which in return was a chalk and they clocked that as um, defiant um, behavior towards CPS. So in return, we had a court date coming up in October, and in October, um, that was one of the reasonings for pulling my children, was that, um, was they classified that as defiant, even though everything was going great. Um, they also used me remodeling my home as neglect towards my children because of um, having wood, nails, tools, so on and so forth. Um, and the whole thing was pretty much just a facade to get my kids is, is what it amounts to, to get, to do whatever they could to get my, my children. I, I do not do drugs and alcohol. My fiance has not done drugs and alcohol. Um, I have not had any reports on me towards anything like that. And the only reason they were involved with my life was because we had asked them for help. And that was a big mistake. Um, and the words and the things that they used towards my children was just absolutely uncalled for. 
um, they, the, the, the allegations from top to bottom were absolutely false in every way you could make one false. There was nothing in our allegations that were towards us that had any basic fact, paperwork, knowledge, anything of nothing. They were all completely drummed up. Um, it, it was just an attack towards my family to disrupt it. Um, they also did say that their objective was not to pull the children and that that's why they put them back or kept them in our care and made them wards of the court. And they were going to keep them in our care because they found in the reports, they said there was no danger for the children to pull them. They found nothing during the six weeks of the, these programs, intensive therapy programs. They were all great reports until the time came to where um, we had, I guess, for their viewpoint, a disagreement about my son's speech therapy. And then boom, that was how she wrote. On October 15th, um, our court date, my lawyer called the night before and said um, that he got a call about 10.30 at nighttime from that caseworker and said that they're gonna go after pulling the kids. And I said, why? And uh, my lawyer said, I have no idea because all reports and everything were great. So <laughs> more or less, maybe as a medical neglect, the speech therapy, they felt he needed speech therapy where you, the family, didn't really think he needed it. Oh, he didn't need it. I've, I've, had, an, I've had children. I've got a 19-year-old who is deaf and he cannot speak. And um, this child has grown up to be just a wonderful young man. And... Um, He's 19 and he's a wonderful young man. And if there was any issues with speech or problems or issues, they would look at my 19 year old through his 19 years and um, realize that we are good parents. We've done a, a very good thing. And we would understand a speech impairment or an impairment at all um, with a child. Um, and that is another issue I have. Um, they supposedly brought up neglect as their issue of pulling my children, which neglect, if you look at it, is very broad ranged. And you could pull a child from any house across America for neglect. It's so broad range. You could go and pull every child out and find some, quote, neglect issue. But they pulled my four children on October 15th, which in return, they were not even supposed to do that because when we were in court, when they went to pull my children, they were the um, caseworker had asked to pull the children that night and the judge said that they could not pull the children because they didn't have, have an order and that the department that does that was not in on Friday that late. And the caseworker said, well, it doesn't matter. We had one done the week before. Let's do it. So before I even got home, I already had police and everybody sitting in my driveway to pull my children. Um, and, you know, I, I will try to be as brief as I can about some things, but there's some other issues that came about this. After they pulled my children, or even way before that, they had asked me for, um, they had asked me for names and numbers of family members to take my children. And I gave them all numbers and everything. It took them three months after they pulled my children to get them into family members' homes. Okay, because they, they made a big mistake and boggled that all up. Even after they did that, they put my children into my brother's home eventually after they went to foster care and bounced around here and there. And in the foster care system, when they got to my brother's home, there was an issue that I find that is striking. They wanted to use an issue that I had a water pressure problem in my home because I had a plugged screen in my home in my water well. So my pressure wasn't exactly the greatest, and the lady had brought up in court about I had some water pressure issue. Well, in the process of my brother getting ready to be a foster parent and getting processed, he had a water problem at his house. He had no water pressure. And so guess what they, they did? What's that? They bought him a water well. <laughs> they bought my brother a water well to get my children in his home but you think that with us asking for help beforehand in helping, in helping me, they don't do that. But what they do is they help my brother get a $5,000 water well put into his home. Exactly. And um, in the process of my children being at my brother's home, we had found out 
that he, uh, the wife, had given my daughter, because she was on some, uh, I believe it was um, anxiety. anxiety medications, because of the anxiety created from being in foster care. She had run out of her anxiety medications, so the mother decided to get some Xanax, is what they call it, and to give my daughter Xanax medication six to eight different times and alcohol. CPS was called by a caseworker. They were interviewed and they admitted to giving Xanax and alcohol. And strikingly, to this day, they're still going to be foster parents. Well, they are having trouble getting foster parents. Well, of course. But, it, but it's a different story if you're a relative trying to get your children. Uh, then they really look at those things. And, and they do look at water pressure as part of the uh, foster care and adoption package. Mm -hmm. They look at the water pressure, how hot your water heater heats. And, you, you know, so this sounds like, to me, a good family here that is going out asking for help with one of their boys and the, you end up having all your children taken. Well, Nicole, now, you were in foster homes. How many foster homes were you in? I was just in one. Just one? Just in one. Was that with the relatives? No, that was um, when I first got taken. I had gone to a couple people in uh, Cedar Springs for about three weeks to a month. Um, after they got the process with going to a relative, um, I was moved there with my... 15 year old brother um, and he was actually staying in Sparta and then we got moved there and it took my little brother and sister like I don't know probably three weeks to another month for them to be moved with us there and they were in a foster home um, up in Howard City and that was just so you so all bad. were separated at one point and then you were all put together Yep. Now, what was your thoughts being in a foster home? I mean, first of all, you got to think, what in the world did your parents do yeah. for you to be taken from them? I mean, what what were your thoughts? What what was your feelings on that? It like, it's just something I don't know. It's just like a feeling that you're wondering why, and then me as obviously their daughter, living with them for 17 years, you know the truth. You know what goes on. And even if I voice my opinion, they still don't listen. I mean, I could, I could defend my parents. I could go against them. I could do whatever. But as long as they get their money, they get, you know, what they want, you know. So how, how old were you when you were taken? 16. 16. So you, so you know everything about your family and all mm -hmm. the secrets and, and everything that goes on. And you're wondering, well, why can't I live with mom and dad? They didn't really do anything wrong. Exactly. But you seen them trusting the system. So how does that make you feel now as a teenager on trusting the system? Are, oh. are you traumatized? Are you thinking, well, boy, this could happen to me? Yeah. yeah well, I better, not, I better not even go down and apply for food stamps. Yeah. <laughs> it makes you scared to do anything with, I mean, even counselors, it's scary, it's scary to, to even, you have to like watch what you say. You cannot say the truth. You can't say nothing. It makes you scared to to speak the truth. It makes you scared to just have anyone there around you. Anything that has to do with the government and state, you don't you don't want it. And you know, like it, it's scary. After you know, like being taken and everything, you still wake up, you know, like wondering if it's gonna happen again. You know, or anyone shows up in an unknown car. It could even if it was a friend from ten years ago. It's scary because you don't know who it is. You're scared of people coming to your house or calling you or anything because it's just it, it's like an instant thing, like you know, and like any time a cop shows up, anything like that, it's just like, are we going to be taken? What's going on? It, it just it's always there. You know, I still get dreams and feelings and thoughts, and it's just. It's so it sounds like you had some nightmares and some very sleepless nights uh, mm -hmm. when you were in foster care. Oh yeah, yes. You know how I put it is, it took my children to go to foster care to actually have problems. Mm -hmm. My kids didn't have problems beforehand. I had a son who had some problems with ADD and ODD and some little issues like that, normal issues that were blown to the point that was incredible. And now all of my children. I had an investigation I called on a, fam on a foster parent's 
because they were spanking my child. Mm -hmm. They were spanking him, which they're not supposed to touch my child. No, they're not. They weren't just spanking the... him. They were having wooden spoons, bruises all up and down. You know, nails How are they stuff? getting away with that? That is part of the curriculum that spanking is not allowed in foster care. They get away with it because the state allows it because there's money to be made. Look, it, 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 it's a plain and simple thing. The state they'll, they'll will take never... you from the parents if they're spanking or whatever. But if you go to a foster parent and they can do whatever and they'll do an investigation, which is supposed to take the kids. When they do an investigation, they leave the kids in there. And then they go there, they talk to the parents, and they close the case and say, oh, well, nothing's going on. They don't listen to the kids. Yeah, they I've, listen to the, what the parents And yeah, I've heard that. Or they give them a little program to work on, or they go there and talk to them. You can't do it no more. You know, don't spank them no more, this and that. My son, during his therapy, my son during his therapy has named that foster parent, and I'm just going to say allegedly, he has named and alleged that foster parent of sexually molesting him. In detail. On more than one in occasion, detail. and we're talking in detail where a three-year-old cannot detail it. And this was done before we even got him back with his, with with his before, before we got he him went back to family, and before he went to family. Yeah, and we see that many times, if that's uh, against a parent, how many times CPS will step right in. Oh, and, you're done. Um, you're done. I mean, um, we have a case in Ottawa County right now, though only three weeks old, and. The person is already on the registry, but has not been charged. The kid's been taken, but has not car been charged because of no uh, proof in criminal court. That's right. And, and, and the whole, the, you know, it, it really, when it comes down to the nitty gritty, you know, uh, it really comes down to, to, to money, a lot of it. Yeah, because they won't get money if they keep money. you with your parents. You know, the state right now is in such disarray with with finances, with financial matters, and plus they were sued just a year or two ago. So they're gonna make sure they pull every single child, whether it's right or wrong or whatever, and they're gonna put you through every system in there and everything. You don't get funded, it's like a business. You don't, you, you know, you have to have clients. You gotta have clients to exist. CPS right. cannot do their job if they don't have clients. You have to have clients. If you don't they have do children, their job in the wrong way. If you don't have children, you're, you're uh, you're out of money. No one to so. oversight, no one to check on them. You have no voice in the family court. You have no way to stand up and say anything. They have no paperwork on you. They have no records on you. Doesn't matter. Anybody they can They cause more problems for families. And they have and immunity. Oh, they love to hear And I'll, I'll tell you, I want to thank you too for coming on. We have to close up. I, I mean, we probably could go on for another hour yet because this this is an incredible story. And But this is a very accurate one. One that we see an awful lot and hear an awful lot. And um, I want to thank you two for coming on and sharing your story with us. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, a family being traumatized for going out and asking for help with a child. Well, um, I want to remind everybody that uh, if you have any comments or if you would like to come join us, uh, for our program, you can email us here at the station at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. We also have a social network that uh, we'd like you to join to get involved. There's many people getting involved. Our voices are being heard, finally. Finally, there's talk in Lansing. I just was in Lansing the other day, and we have people that go to Lansing every week. We're pounding it in their heads. We need change and we demand change. You can join our social network at miparentalrights.ning.com. That's miparentalrights.ning.com. Once again, thank you for joining us for Silent Voices. We're, we'll see you here right next week. Same time, same channel. So remember, until next week, your voice can make the difference. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dennis Lawrence, president and founder of Michigan for Parental Rights. Recently, Michigan for Parental Rights has become an allied organization of parentalrights.org. This is the organization that is pushing the Parental Rights Amendment. I'd like to take a moment to reach, read to you what the proposed Parental Rights Amendment would look like. In section one, it says the liberty of parents to direct the upbringing and education 
of their children is a fundamental right. Second, section 2 says that the net, neither the United States nor any state shall infringe upon this right without demonstrating that its governmental interests as applied to the person is of the highest order and not otherwise served. And section three of this uh, amendment says, no treaty may be adopted, nor shall any source of international law be employed to supersede, modify, interpret, or apply to the rights guaranteed by this article. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to get our parental rights reinstated in the United States of America. We are seeing our parental rights being thrown out the door by the Supreme Court, the lower courts. We have to make sure that the United Nations Child's Rights of the Treaty does not pass because if this pass, it'll throw out any parental rights that a parent ever possesses. Here at Michigan Parental Rights, we ask that you join us, that you contact your local congressman, your local representative to vote on a bill to tell the United States of America that we want this parental rights amendment established as an amendment to the U.S. Constitution in Washington, D.C. Uh, we are uh, looking at possibly this resolution being introduced in the House sometime this fall. We ask that you join us and let our representatives know that we need this amendment passed. Thank you.